We are ready for the preaching of the word. And brother, we've been praying for you faithfully. And we're ready for the preaching. I think uh, most of you know Paul one way or another through the years. He was 35 years pastor at Palmer, Massachusetts. And before that, he was 10 years Highland Falls uh, right beside West Point in New York, and he's been seven years since he retired, seven years already since he retired that he's been preaching, filling in, filling in all over, and so I think most of you know Paul, and we're looking forward to the preaching of the word. I've been looking forward to coming. Uh, <clears throat> always enjoy coming here and preaching through the years. And uh, wish my wife could be here. Uh, she suffers with cough variant asthma. Plus, on top of that, GERD. Now, not, it's not the GERD like you wake up with during the night. <laughs> this is a problem with coughing. And uh, she's had this since the 80s. And uh, it has gotten worse. And then... We had a form of the wonderful virus that's going around. And what it did for her is it made her cough worse. So she travels with me on weekends, where she can usually go out in the hall or whatever. She gets a coughing fit. And, uh, but she said, you know, here she's at Hun. I'll probably end up most of the time up in the room. And she said, you go, I'll pray. And so she wished she could be here. Uh, she has been my wife for 53 years. And I thank the Lord for her. Uh, it's been a blessing. By the way, in case some of you have ever suffered with it, uh, one of the things, one thing I got that was wonderful, turn to Joshua 6. I noticed that I was having trouble periodically preaching or whatever with all of a sudden, right out of the blue, dry mouth. And I was at my doctor's just having a checkup. And I mentioned, I said, uh, once in a while I get this thing with an awful dry mouth, just quick. And uh, she said, that is part of COVID. You're going to have that for months. Boy, that was encouraging. <laughs> so the, the cough drop company loves to see me coming. I buy the big bags, you know, that say 70 or 80 or 90. And if I keep a cough drop in, that helps the mouth keep dry, or what if it gets dry. And uh, so... I don't have a cold. I'm feeling fine. It's just I have to do this uh, as I travel and preach. And we have enjoyed uh, traveling, speaking. Uh, in the Bible here, in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. How many of you ever been to Israel? You? Anybody been to Israel? You know, one of the things that hits you while you're in Israel is this. When you see the Sea of Galilee, you go, Wow, there really is a Sea of Galilee. In fact, that's one of the things they say to you, is you'll find that when you go to Israel, that Israel is real. But you know it's real. The Bible says so. Then we went down to an area down in Je where Jericho was. And we stood there by an area looking down and where they've done some excavation. And here is left over the corner of a wall of the city of Jericho. Just we're going to read tonight. There it is. You see it. And since I've been there in 1988, they've dug more out. I saw some new pictures of it. They've dug more out. But you know what the morons say? Excuse me. The men who don't believe the Bible? Those archaeologists, that doesn't prove anything. That isn't Jericho. Oh, Jericho, the walls didn't fall down. Uh, they didn't march around. That didn't happen. It's just an old story of the Bible. They're still telling that today. And yet you go over there to Israel and you see so many things where you go, wow, it really happens. Oh, wow, it's really real. Notice here in the sixth chapter, now, well, they've crossed, they've crossed the Jordan. Boy, I mean, you know, Joshua must have thought, well, that's over with. And then right in front of them, now Jericho was straightly shut up 
because of the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thine hand Jericho. Now, stop right there. You know, we look and say, well, they had to go around all those times, and they did. That was God's plan. That's the way he wanted it done. But notice he said, I have given. But then it was a, a done thing, completed thing. It's going to happen. What am I going to start realizing when God says something in his word? Just believe it. Just say it. That's right. Okay, that's fine. See, I have given thine hand, uh, thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thus shall ye do six days. So one, two, three, every day. And the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of the ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Of course, we know what happened. It went the first day, nothing. Second day, nothing. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And each morning, I think what you see here is that Joshua said, okay, folks, this wasn't just two or three hundred people. Some say it could have been as many as over a million. But folks, we're going to march around again today. Now, I don't want to hear a word. Famous last words in a Christian school. I don't want to hear a word. <laughs> yeah. But it worked here. Can you imagine that crowd being quiet, not saying a word? Seventh day, seven times. And then the Lord said, they're going to blow the trumpets. You shout, and the walls fall down. I did some looking into this whole thing as far as the walls. And they have discovered this as they've dug up. Jericho was built with double wall of brick. Six feet through was the first outer wall on the edge of a mound. And I saw the mound, that's right. Inner wall was 12 to 15 feet from the outer wall. So here's the outer wall, 12 to 15 feet, inner wall. I mean, this was quite a, quite a building, or quite a place. About 30 feet high. Oh, that's not, 30, that's, that's not even close to half of that. 30 feet high. Huge. Now, I'm building to something in just a few minutes in the message. We're going to just look into all of this to see what happened. Of course, on this wall, Rahab's house over the space between, they believe probably, the space between the outer and the inner wall. And thus, it was easy for her to have a cord hanging out the window. Uh, and she had helped the spies when they came in. And we see that because of that, she and her family were going to be spared. The rest of the city destroyed. Now, I pastored for almost 10 years beside the West Point Military Academy in New York from 1971 to 1980. I talked to some of the servicemen, military men, captains, majors, colonels who were in our church. Some of them taught warfare teaching the men warfare. And of course, some later became generals and so forth. But you know, the way they did this was not the way they do it at West Point. It's not the way that anybody else does this. You never see it anywhere else in history where it happened this way. But it's our Lord that says, my ways are not your ways, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. There are ways that God works, and we're facing huge Jerichos, and the Lord says, now this is the way we're going to do it, biblically. Wow. And so the whole thing took place. The wall fell down. They say the outer wall, and I saw that. It went down this way, and then the inner wall, which is 12 or 15 feet away, went down inside from that one. It must have been a tremendous noise. I mean, we talk about the towers that went in New York. Uh, this was not as big as that, but can you imagine this? And all the death, and all the dead bodies, and all of the, it was just unbelievable. When God gave the victory, I was preaching in Alaska 19, uh, five years ago. It was a great big mountain of a man, it made me feel small. And uh, we were talking about some things, and he said, and I had preached to them part of this series on Jericho. I preached nine times there. He came to me, and he just heaving. Wanted to cry. 
He said, Pastor, I've got some hu a huge Jericho in my life. I didn't ask him what it was. He said, I've got a huge Jericho. Will you pray for me? You could tell that was a huge thing. That's the way it was with these people. So the Lord told them, this is what you're going to do. This is how it's going to be cap uh, captured. They must, they must have haunted them. They must have felt stupid. Have you ever done things that you know the Bible says you're supposed to do, but because of the world's ways, you feel stupid? This isn't the way the world does it. No, who cares what they think? This was going to be a totally different way. The first day around. The second day around. To, uh, to Israel, Jericho still remained the same after the first day. Get up the next morning, there it was. 30-foot high wall at least. Double walls. The enemy in there is looking out over at us. And of course, the Bible says at first they were greatly frightened about this. And I'll tell you, when you're living for the Lord and you're trying to do something right, the world's going to be scared. Like, what is wrong with them? What's happening there? I had a preacher friend of mine that's now in glory. He pastored a large church in Virginia Beach, Virginia, back years ago. And he told me that they had a speaker come speak just for a weekend. And that weekend, God got a hold of that place. The church had about 800 in it. But God got a hold of it. There were people in the church that got saved. There were people that, that just had never really stepped out for the Lord, and all of a sudden they're excited for the Lord. And he said, brother, it got so good. He said, one night I had a telephone call. And the telephone call, in the middle of the night, the guy said, you reverend so-and-so? Yes. What is happening in your church? Can you please tell me, how do I get saved? You see, God was at work. In several weeks there, and I've never heard anything of it before or since, 500 people came to Christ in that church. Pastor said to me, just pray I won't mess it up. What God is doing, this wasn't any Pentecostal thing. Some of you folks know Dr. Rod Bell, who used to be around preaching years ago and pastored that church. He's with the Lord now. He said, God did a wonderful thing. He just couldn't get over it. People have been praying for years that souls will be saved, and then all of a sudden God went, yes! Oh, listen. We look at this. To Israel, every morning they got up with those first six, day, six days, still there. Why is God doing this anyway? Why does he have me walk or us walk around this city, not saying a word, which is really hard for Baptists to do? I mean, they couldn't even talk about the goodbye downtown at the grocery store or at the great restaurant they'd been to. I'm just being facetious. The seventh day, Joshua said, now we're going to do something different today. Oh, great. We're going to do this seven times in one day. Oh, don't say a word. They didn't know what was going to happen. It was just God had told them back in the previous chapter, as well as right here, what he was going to do. One man put it this way. Jericho was captured without a shot being fired. Without an arrow being shot. Without a catapult being used to go over the wall. Not a thing. God did it. Jericho was captured. What does it teach us? about God delivering his people. Well, number two, how was it captured? How was it captured? Not by mechanical means or human methods. Now, we live in a day in many churches where they're more interested in programs than they are, what does the Bible say? And so let's see if this program works. Or let's see if this pragmatism works. We'll try this or we'll try that. And the Lord's going to, oh, excuse me, I'm right here. Why are you doing that? Back in the tents at night, could it have been? I don't know. I don't get it why Joshua was doing this. Why is God having us walk around this place like he is? And then seven times the last day. You see, how was it done? Observe carefully things about the faith that caused these walls to, to do this. First of all, faith was taught, tested. In the human speaking, as they walked around that wall, 
they say it was 30 feet high. After you look at it for a while, it probably seemed to them 60 feet high. We just can't do this. There's no way we can defeat that city. God brought us across the Jordan, that's great, but this city is just can't be done. I wonder if every pastor would ever tell how many times they've had said to them, it just can't be done. It just hasn't done that way. Rather than, what's the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Thirteen times they walked around that city. No reason had been given them except Joshua said, this is what God wants. This is what you're supposed to do. It had been explained to Joshua, and he gave them the instructions for that day. You know, the Bible says, give us this day our daily bread. The Lord leads us one day at a time, one step at a time. But Lord, I want to know what's going to happen 10 years from now. Just to follow the Lord that day. Around the city, around they went. He gave them instructions. You see, the center feature of it, if you look at verse 4 of chapter 6. Was it Joshua? Oh, it must have been the soldiers. Oh, it was the trumpets. No. Look at verse 4. And the priest shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of the horns on the seventh day, and ye shall compass the city seven times, and so forth. I'm trying to find a reason. Verse 4. The Bible tells us, I think it's seven times in this passage, refers to the ark. The ark. The ark. That was their place of worship. That was the place was the symbol of God's presence. It had brought them by God's grace across the Jordan. And now every day they go around that wall six times, or each once a day, and then the, the last time seven. What was the center part of it? The ark, the place of worship. The center of this whole thing was God. Folks, in this day in which we live, the center must be the Lord. He says, be still and know that I am God. In my first church, up on the wall, back there is a framed Still there, a big framed thing with a nice wooden background with gold letters that stand out about this fire. And all it says is, be still and know that I am God. I looked when I was there the last time, still up there. And from 71 to even now, it's there. But what a reminder, you go into church, shh, be still and know that I am God. What are you bringing in today? What discouragement? What heartache? What? Be still and know that I am God. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, the center feature of the, of the whole possession was the ark. Seven times in that chapter is mentioned. And what was being tested to Israel was their faith. I didn't say fate. I said faith. I have had the joy in the last year of working not every Sunday, but usually every other Sunday or every third Sunday, going to Laconia, New Hampshire. It's about a 115, 16-mile drive down there from where we live. What a joy it's been. But when I went there the first time in 2018, the church was in a mess, a heartache. Beautiful facility. About 15 people. They had no idea what was going to happen, if they were going to close it, whatever what God was going to do. And then my cousin's husband, who was a head of a mission that helps churches like this, went up from Pennsylvania and worked with them. And they went to the bank and they found out that they owed $750,000. 15 people. They didn't know that the pastor who ran everything, paid everything, wrote all the checks, they didn't know what, how far he had jacked this thing up when they were building the facility. What would you do? Take the flag down, let's go home. They were challenged to pray. They were challenged to trust. They met, they prayed. They brought in an interim pastor, it was there three years, did a tremendous ministry. When I went back a year ago this month, after he had to leave because of health problems, I went back, I couldn't believe the change. The people were excited. The people were excited about the things of the Lord. And folks, just two months ago, I sat in a business meeting there where the treasurer got up and said all that they owe the bank is $40,000. Who did that? Must have been your cousin's husband, head of a mission. No, no, no. 
the Lord led them. They had tons of land. They sold some of the land. They sold two buildings on the land that were almost sacred. One had been the pastor's home, and the other one, the principal's home. Beautiful log cabins, nice fireplaces. They sold them. Didn't need them. God began to work in other ways. And now that church out of 15 is 50. And they're excited. I'll be finishing the first Sunday of September here. I told somebody here, it's like being a foster parent. You get taken care of the child, and you work with the people, and you love them, and then you got to step back and take your hands off. God did that. You talk about a Jericho, $750,000. We can't do it. Now, the people marched around the first day, the second, the third, the fourth. Probably every day they walked around that wall, it got bigger. How are we going to take this? We can't do this. The Lord is saying, that's the idea. You can't. And the Lord has to put us in places sometimes where we just have to admit, you know, I can't do it. And then we go, what do you want, Lord? He said, you going to trust me? Well, yes. Trust me. Yes, it was a symbol of that walking around those times, testing their faith. They were able to walk around silently, daily, not knowing what the next day was going to be, but yet they were told that's what God wanted. Sometimes, you know, preachers preach the word of God from the pulpit, and people sit there and go, yeah, I don't like that way. But if it's God's way, what are you going to say? If God's in it, go for it. Let's see what God will do. The, the, the ark had brought them to the Jordan. The symbol of past experiences reminded them. And praise God for past experiences where you can look back and say, look what the Lord did. I came here 18 years ago, visited my brother-in-law and my sister. And I want to tell you something. If you weren't here then, it is amazing what God has done in this place. Really. It is just, every time I come in, I go, wow. Look what God's done. When God's in it, and you who go here, it's easy to take it for granted. Yeah, we got. Yeah, but God has done this, and He keeps working. He keeps taking care of these things. Yes, we see them going around the symbol of the past experience. The Bible says in verse eleven, "The ark of the Lord encompassed the city." Jesus, I thought it was the people. They were with it, but the ark went around the city. Verse eleven. The faith was. God is going to do this. God went around with them 13 times. And then in verse 16, the Bible tells us in that wonderful verse, And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Boom. Huh. Hmm. Isn't God good? Isn't God great? God must do it, and that's what we must learn. We trust him. He may use us, or he may use something else. He may use someone else, but God does it. We trust him and let him do it. Not that we're lazy. We obey and say, okay, Lord, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. One little kid sang it, trust and okay. Now, you had it right. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. You see, God expects nothing more from us than failure. Because we try to do it with our strength, we will fail. Any great work that's been done for God through the years is because it was by faith in what God wanted done, and they simply just followed him as what to do. You know, the Bible says, and he says to us, for without me, ye can do nothing. Faith tested by silence. Now, third point. What is your Jericho? I don't know what you've walked in here with in your heart and mind. It may be a family problem. It may be a heartache. It may be in your own self. You're struggling with indifference. Maybe indifference about the lost or indifference about God. Maybe you're struggling with materialism. Maybe you're struggling with paganism unconsecrated lives, maybe unforgiveness. I just can't, I cannot forgive that person. 
Listen, if God says to forgive them, you ought to forgive. Yeah, it's just hard to obey by faith. You have tried to take it by yourself, and here you are, still walking around it. No. I asked the preacher in Alaska, how's so-and-so doing? Great. Boy. I mean, just, wow. You know what it told me? God gave him the victory. Whatever it was, God gave him the victory. I had a man in my church in Massachusetts named Tom Fogg. He was a pastor's son from many years before. He drove a charter bus for West Point, drove teams all over the eastern seaboard. I mean, drove all the time. You know what his problem was? Cigarettes. He knew his body belonged to the Lord. His body is a temple of God, and yet here he was. He'd smoke them. He'd literally come forth sometimes and put it in the offering plate. There you go, Lord. And then he'd be out smoking the next day. And so one day he came to me and said, I need to talk with you. What is it, Tom? He said, praise God, he's given me the victory. He did it. He said, now I did something I know it's against the law. I was driving my bus late at night. Everybody's asleep on the bus. And I'm going like this, looking for my cigarettes. And I pulled them out and said, you know what? They are controlling me. God isn't. Open the window. Boom. Out the window. I littered. He never touched one after that because he realized he couldn't do it. He said, Lord, I'm asking you to do it. I yield. I submit. You know, he, he became treasurer of the church, trustee in the church. For that, he wouldn't do anything. He'd be the last one in and the first one out each Sunday morning. When he got things right over that little thing, his little Jericho, things began to happen. But he took faith. Faith that he could not do it. Faith that God could. And he realized it was controlling him and God wasn't. One man put it this way. God does not want better methods. God wants better men. We try the methods. Maybe this will work. Maybe that will work. Maybe this. You know, my wife and I get tired of that sometimes. And if you're offended by this, I'm sorry. But, you know, it's almost like we think sometimes. We're, I take medication. I'm a diabetic. So I take medication. But sometimes, after a while, it's like they go in the back room. I don't, this will work. I take this one. This has proved, you know, and they're like, yeah. You know, yeah. I was up here preaching a men's retreat three years ago. And the doctor said, here, I want you to use this for your diabetes. And it was a special thing. Wanted me to use it. And he told me to use it about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I did it upstairs uh, in the room, sleeping in tonight. And I, I remember I came down, my wife was here, and, and, and I came down, I went out to talk to some men. It was cold. It was a men's retreat, October. I was out there in a short sleeve shirt, and my wife's like, what is wrong with him? I went in to eat supper. It tasted awful. No offense, ladies. It was awful. My wife's, what's wrong? I said, I'm not feeling good. That's awful, whatever I took. But I took it the next morning. Sure enough, I went out in cold weather, felt hot. I went to eat, tasted terrible. So I went back to my doctor and said, I don't want this. I don't want any of it. I want that. I'll take what I've been taking. Fine. But sometimes it's like, and that's the way we treat God. We'll try this. He said, I'm right here. I'm right here. Have you talked to me about it? Have you been in God's word? Have you been on your knees? At church in Lacona, they've been on their knees. They've been trusting God. They are so excited. They're so excited. And immediately, they called. They had a few challenges with this or that. Not the money, other things. So Keith and I got on the phone with them, talked to them, encouraged them this way. It worked. You know what? You do it God's way, it does work. But man's way is, we've got to try this and try this, and we lay awake all night and toss and turn, rather than saying, Lord, what would you have me do? Show me in your word. Help me, Lord. What would you do? And when he does it, whew. And so this interim pastor said, Brother Anderson, it is just wonderful what God did. Huh. What he did, I can't believe. You see, he, he is so great. He is so mighty. He is so powerful. One more thought. How do we deal with these Jerichos? Whatever yours is. And maybe I didn't list it. I preached at one retreat, and I wasn't preaching on this. 
but I had some men come up and share with broken hearts. They were dealing as Christian men with pornography. And they wanted help. You know, you, you, find, you find things that are just a huge thing in front of you. If I could just get past this, and the devil said, that's it. You can't do it. No, but God gives the victory. He gets, and on they went. They went around Jericho, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times the next day. The walls went down. Praise the Lord. By faith. The answer to Jericho was to trust. Look at chapter 5 and verse 14. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith the Lord unto thy servant? How did this all start getting the victory of Jericho? Joshua on his face before God. Realizing all these people are looking to him, here was this massive city. In fact, they tell us it probably was one of the greatest strongholds of the Canaanite area in that whole area. Here's this city. Wow. God, so you're going to trust me? You're going to trust me? You see, when people wait on God and listen for his voice and pray, they begin to be afraid. You know, I can't do this. I can't do this. And the Lord's going, that's right. I can. It may not be the way you would do it. It may, may not be the way whatever would do it. But to trust God. To trust him. How did it fall? They sounded the trumpets. The people shouted. Down went the walls. When I pastored in Palmer, and I won't go into this long because it's too long to tell about, we need an education building. We wanted to build out behind. The first one was going to be connected to the church, and we decided to have it across the driveway. And as I looked at this, I'm not saying any other pastor was wrong or any other church was wrong, but I said to the men as I met with the trustees and the deacons, I believe God wants us to do this debt-free. And I couldn't believe I was saying it, because everything in those days, you all ran to the bank for it. I said, if our country crashes, I want us to be able to look the bank right straight in the eye and not owe us in. We still going to carry the ministry on. But you know these men, he said, let's go for it. I preached to the church. We prayed. People prayed. We had prayer meetings. And you know the story. Some of you do. We were given an 80 by 72 Butler building that was sitting in Sinsbury, Connecticut by a company. They would take it down, bring it up to us. We just had to pay to put it back up. God did it. God did it. It's still there today. We got it up, ready for the fall, and we put the students over there now, most of them, instead of in the church building. One problem, we didn't have a furnace. What are you going to do about it? So I said, man, we got to pray. He gave us the building. Uh, we, we believe he wants us to go through this debt-free. And it was the warmest fall we'd ever had. I said, pray for a south wind. A guy came to my office, not from our church. He had helped support a student to go to our school. It was in a high school. But he came and he walked into my office. He sat down. He said, I understand you need a furnace for your building over there. He was a doctor. I said, yeah, we do. We're just waiting on the Lord. And this guy was a Christian. He said, how much? I said, $5,700. That's all of the, you know, all that stuff over there like that. The furnace, everything. He wrote a check. I said, put your furnace in. Now, you don't get that happen too often. But I'll tell you, it was things like this that just put steel in the arms, in the hearts of the deacons, the trustees. It was like, look what God did. Yeah? Now, you're Jericho you're facing tonight. Whatever it is that you walked in, maybe you've been carrying it for months, years. Have you really gone to the Lord about it? Have you really... Poured your heart out to him. Have you perhaps even had good friends of yours praying with you about this? And sometimes it may take years. See, Some of you are praying for wayward children. And sometimes 
I've seen some don't come back to the Lord until the parents have died. But the God answered prayer in his timing. You see, we just see all this is happening right now. All this is being done. But you don't know what he's doing over here, what he's doing over here, what he's doing over there. And you can imagine the children of Israel marching around there. And at first, the people from Jericho were afraid. But now they're, they're hollering out taunts. Hey, you weirdos out there. That's not the way you do it. What are you doing? Say something. Come on. Sixth day. Huh. We've seen this before. Seventh day. Twice. Three, four, five, six. What's this? Don't worry what the world thinks. Don't even worry what your Christian friends think that really aren't interested too much in the things of the Lord. Say, Lord, be like Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When I preached uh, Heath's graduation here last month, I preached from Joshua. One nine, and the other two times where the Lord says, be strong, be strong, be strong. I'm saying to you tonight, be strong. Be strong in the Lord. You see, I want it fixed right now. No, listen, we're so instant, used to instant potatoes and instant this and instant that. The Lord says, no, 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 no. You're trusting me. I made this universe. I know about your Jericho. Tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about the fall of Jericho. There's more to it. We're going to begin to look into this thing, and then, you see, tomorrow night, more. And the next day, more problems. You see, we see, if I can just go through this problem in my life, this Jericho, it's clear sailing after that. Who have you been listening to on television? You look at the disciples, they didn't have one challenge, and that was it, and boy, it was just great after that. These things cause us to grow and become stronger in the Lord. I mean, in the 40s, 40 years I pastored, I went through some awful times at times. And yet, the Lord got me through these, and through these I learned more about him, more about Jesus, what I know, more of his grace to others show, to go through these challenges and say, but Lord, look at this. Listen, don't shy away from the challenges. We had a guy that came to Bible college and I was there. He had been in the Navy, and he got saved. He came to Bible college, married man. The rest of us were all young right out of high school in our class. And when the teacher would come in and say, okay, now for this semester, here are the things you're going to expect. 10,000 word paper on this. And, and he's he, right out loud, he's going, pour it on. Wally, shh. Pour it on. Because he got saved. It was like, I lived that life. I want to get all I can get. I want to serve the Lord. Give it to me. We're all younger and going crazy. He learned something that we all had to gradually learn. Pour it on, Lord. We either want to run and want to quit. And that's the thing. Run. We have track stars, Christians today. Run from this to this to this. Rather than facing, Lord, this is where I am right now. Here's my Jericho. Wow. Now, I challenge you tonight. Before you go to bed, if you're struggling with something, something that maybe it's in your family, maybe it's outside, maybe it's at, at work, maybe it's whatever it might be, go to the Lord about it. I got the most wonderful text this week to me and the other three leaders at the church in New Hampshire. One of the men there is a tech for a corporation that goes in and straightens out uh, networking for banks and so forth, and he's, he's a there was a man that he was working with and his team who was wicked, who was awful, hard to work with, and he said, I mean, he had a filthy mouth, he had a, and it was like, Lord, help me be a testimony to this guy. We've stayed in this guy's home, the, the good guy. He said, pray. You know what? He and another guy who worked here was a Christian started praying. Lo and behold, that man got called in. And he wasn't fired, but he was put in a completely different area. And guess who was put together to run that thing? The man from the church where I've been going and the other Christian. He said, I can't believe God did this like this. Just worked it all out. Do you think he has a 
corner on this? Our Bible is full of people that learn that God can. If it's, in, if it's his will and he's in it, he can. Sometimes we make the plan and say, okay, you put your okay on it, Lord. He said, no, I got a different way. You're going to follow me? Like march around the wall? May God speak to our hearts tonight. And I'm praying, and my wife has been praying, that as we get into this, through this until, until Saturday morning, that we, we, it'll be like liquid wrench working in our hearts. Areas that perhaps we just said, well, I'll never get that Jericho out of the way. No, you won't. But have you trusted God to do it? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the good attention of the people tonight. This is a story we've been taught since Sunday school. A true happening in the word of God. But Lord, you can affiliate with it. We've all had Jerichos. And they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we get smaller and smaller and say, I can't do it. The Lord says, good. I can. Teach us, Lord. Help those who are struggling tonight. Give us a good night's rest. Bring us back tomorrow to hear more. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Seems like so many Christians today are like, God's way doesn't make any sense. And it's too, you know, it's just, it's too different. It's too strange. We're not going to do that. And just like Pastor Anderson said, is you're not going to bring your Jericho down. The wall's not going to come down. You want to try to do it your way? Talk about beating your head on a wall. That's a big wall. And just do it God's way. And a lot of churches have tried all kinds of different methods. And God just says, do it my way. God help us. Pray we hide God's word in our hearts. And that we might not sin against God.